Thanks for coming, everyone. So today we'll introduce the recent update on the ASU Titan microscope. So we'll talk about the new electron detectors and the new spectrometer. First, I want to quickly review the existing capabilities. So this microscope provides atomic resolution. So for a TM mode, it provides 0.7 angstrom spatial or information limit. And for STEM, it provides about 1.5 angstrom. It has energy dispersed X-ray spectrometer for uh, elemental analysis. And with the new EUS detector and spectrometer, we can also do fast uh, mapping using EUS. This microscope also has a monochromator, which can provide energy resolution down to 0.15 EV. And with the environmental gas cell, it can give gas pressure up to 10 toll with different gases like CO2, oxygen, and water. So with a heating holder, the temperature can go from room temperature to 1,000 degrees C. And with a liquid nitrogen holder, it can go down to minus 180 degrees. This microscope also has a tomography holder, which can go from minus 60 degrees to 60 degrees for 3D imaging. It also has Lawrence mode for imaging magnetic materials. The new detector, which is funded by an ASF uh, proposal, led by Peter. I will briefly review the improvement of the new detector. For a conventional detector, the electron signal is converted first to a photon signal. And during the conversion process, there is some uh, reflection in the scintillator layer, which will uh, deviate the spatial resolution. And with the new direct electron detector, the spatial resolution can be greatly enhanced. And there are two different types of direct electron detector. For example, we have introduced the detector on the nanomicroscope. microscope. It is a hybrid pixelated detector where the electrons goes to a sensor chip and then it goes to the readout chip. So the benefit of this design is that this design is sensitive to low voltage. So the nanomicroscope microscope can do good use and also probably diffraction imaging under 30 kV, 60 kV, and 100 kV. For the Titan microscope, we have the Gatan K suite direct detector. The architecture is different. You can see in this diagram that the readout circuit is exactly on the top of the detector. So it is very close to the interaction region with electron beam. So this architecture provides ultimate spatial resolution, but the issue is that it's only sensitive to high voltages. For example, if you do 80 kV imaging, this ray really won't help you. Here are some technical details on the Titan upgrade. We have a new spectrometer. Titan imaging filter enables both use uh, and also energy filter imaging. So we have three new detectors. The major one is the Gatan K3S detector, which offers imaging diffraction and use with a large pixel array and a pixel size of five micrometer. It can read out very fast at 1,500 frames per second. But here we need to show that it only do this at a low dose rate, say at most 40 electrons per pixel per second. So you cannot imagine high beam current with this detector. So this is perfect for imaging beam sensitive material. For the continual camera, it can work at imaging diffraction and use mode. We have this new detector on purpose to do imaging at lower KV, say 80 KV, because of the K3 is not sensitive enough at the lower voltage. We also have a one view camera, uh, which is mainly used for imaging and diffraction. It has 4K by 4K pixel array with a large pixel size of 15 micrometer. It also offers like 25 frames per second with a very large field of view. So most of the users will be using the one view camera. We need to upgrade the microscope itself to allow the installation of these new instruments. Here is a Gatan K3 detector plot, which shows the modulation transfer function versus the Nyquist limit and also the DQE curve. They are very good at low frequencies, but if it goes high, it can go down to 0.2 at one Nyquist limit. Now, Professor Crozier will talk about some interesting results. So we just wanted to show a few examples of things that you can do because of the limited time. We'll just talk about the K3. 
which is the mu detector. And so one of the things is if you're looking at uh, radiation sensitive materials, this detector has extremely small readout noise, which means that we can do something called dose fractionation. So if you wanted to say do a one second exposure, but your material might damage, rather than doing a one second exposure, which is what we would do in the old detectors, you can do say 75 exposures that are say a 75th of a second or a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second. So you'd acquire a thousand images rather than one image. So what I'm showing you here is the surface of Syria. We ran the sensor at 75 frames per second. So we're recording three and a half thousand by three and a half thousand pixels, 75 times per second. And this is one of the frames and you might think, well, that's way too noisy for me. So then I can just take uh, this and add 10 frames together. And then I can add all 75 frames together and get a one second exposure. And the point about this is because the noise is dominated by Poisson counting noise, you pay no penalty in terms of signal to noise when you, when you do this dose fractionation. With the old detectors that have very large readout noise, if you divide your image into two half second readouts, you'll get twice as much readout noise. The readout noise is negligible here. So we can play all sorts of games and you can decide how much of the data stream you trust. And, and, and so that's really something that's incredibly helpful. So that's playing with the signal to noise. Then the other thing, of course, is that you can do in situ observations at high time resolution. And this is just the same frames again, running at 75 frames per second now. And again, you can decide afterwards whether or not that's too noisy. Maybe you would like to frame average or do some other processing, or maybe you want to you know, frame average or, or some frames one to 50 and frames 300 to 700, you know, you're not limited in what you can do. So you have complete flexibility in processing the data. Uh, this is a cerium oxide surface. We are interested in the oxygens, which shows these very faint features here. And maybe you can see that sometimes you see oxygen and sometimes you don't. That's because oxygen is coming, going in and coming out of the lattice. And so we are able to see that. And with this detector, you can run at you know, up to 1,000 frames per second. Uh, it's easy to do up to 256 frames per second without any effort. But you can, if you're prepared to do some work, you can go at 1,000 frames per second. The other thing which we've noticed in doing preliminary measurements is the very large field of view, almost 3,500 by 3,500 pixels, being able to run with such large fields of view at such high data rates is also a big advantage. So typically, you can grab a movie of an image from a large area, as is shown here. This is now platinum nanoparticles on a Syria cube. And then you can decide afterwards what part is most interesting and which part you find the best. And we just wanted to show the digital micrograph, which is the program, just to give you an example of the, the ways in which you can sort of play with processing the data. So we've just zoomed in now. We just put out and zoomed in on one of the the particles from here. And what we're doing is, if I show you the single frame at 1 75th of a second, again, you might say, well, that's a bit too noisy for my eyes. So you can do frame averaging, running frame averaging, if you want. And depending on what kind of time resolution you might be interested in, you can sum many frames, or you can just sum a few frames. So you can see that in this case, this platinum nanoparticle is dynamically very active. And so in my group, we are interested in studying these kind of things. But of course, there are other systems you might be interested in as well. So I think it back to Shizé now. Now I will introduce some other examples. Here is one example. We use the T3 detector to do some quick stamp use mapping. So this is a platinum copper alloy nanosheet from Erkman Group in NAU. So we operate the microscope at 300 kV. And here shows one some spectrum from the sample. You can clearly show the copper L edge and the platinum M edge. With this edge at a pixel size of seven astrom with pixel array of 150 pixels. And we, have, we get to the data in about 200 seconds and shows beautiful distribution of copper and platinum, which is good because platinum is very heavy. Usually it is only doable for EDX. But with the new detector and the new spectrometer, we can do platinum. Here's another example using the K3 for some bio-grown iron oxide particles. 
Here is the typical U spectrum of oxygen and iron. And we can quickly get this result within uh, about 50 seconds and shows beautiful distribution of the elements. Here is another example that we can use 80 kV operating at TM mode to image the beam sensitive carbon nanotube materials. We can get atomic resolution with the help of the aberration corrector. And, and just to say on this one, we're not using the K3, we're using the other camera, the CMOS that you, you see in the slides, and that has much better sensitivity at 80 kV, but not such good sensitivity at 300 kV. So that's why we have both sensors, uh, and both are located at the back of the, the spectrometer. For those people that are interested in the STEM capability on the microscope, here is one slide showing the silicon dumbbell which has a spacing of 0.136 nanometers, so we can achieve atomic resolution for such materials. And we're still working on to improve that by potentially in the future to have the other early STEM capability. And just for STEM people in the audience, of course, it's not probe corrected, so it's not going to compete with, say, the, the Joel ARM or the NION in terms of spatial resolution, but I think you can see it's a very nice scanning system. It's pretty stable at resolutions of about one and a half angstroms. It's very nice. Now, Professor Grozier will talk about more examples. Yeah, if we've got an, it's not just an EELS spectrometer, it's an EELS imaging filter that we have on the microscope. So you can actually do energy filter the imaging and diffraction analysis on this. And I just wanted to show, again, this is some ag aggregate of Syria cubes where we're using the plasmon part of the spectrum, the low loss part of the spectrum to uh, form images. And so here's a spectrum obtained from the surface plasmon mode, the bulk plasmon mode. At, uh, these are 25 and 35 electron volts. And then I've done some manipulation here to enhance the surface effect so that you can see the highlighting of the little cubes because that's where the surface plasmon resonance is highest. And the point about this is that, again, we're taking these energy filtered images over very large areas and also in very short periods of time. I think the average exposure time for these was something like four seconds. So, so this is something that'd be much harder to do by STEM. Uh, so for problems where you know you want to map out large areas, looking for say defects uh, in quantum materials that have well resolved optical fingerprints, this is a good way to, to go. Yeah. And then you know just to finish, how can you use the Titan to benefit your research? So Cheesy and I are happy to serve as consultants to chat with you about your projects. And I know that we've done that for many of you that are in the room, but the Iring Center allows short proof of concept demonstrations on your samples, you know, something like one to two hours, not one to two weeks, you know, and there are monies that you can apply for on campus to get access if you want to do longer extensive testing. The capabilities of, even though the Titan microscope is quite old, but the, it has a unique combination of capabilities, which I don't think are reproduced anywhere else in the world right now. And so that's a big advantage to proposals. If you're writing proposals, you can essentially make your proposal stand out from everybody else's and increase your chance of funding. So we're going to generate a couple of documents, just one or two pages, with some of the technical language described, describing the technical capabilities of the microscope, so that you can cut and paste that into your proposals. And of course, we are happy to edit and read sections of the proposal to make sure that it's technically correct. In terms of getting data, if someone in your group has some TEM experience already, you know, they can use one of the other microscopes, then you can have them be trained on using the Titan. I mean, there's different aspects of it, basic TEM and the Titan with, you know, something like one angstrom imaging is with the aberration corrector is not too difficult for someone that has some experience in electron microscopy. The basic eels and elemental mapping is also not too difficult if you have a little bit of experience. Doing the in situ work with the hot stages and the gases, that certainly is a bit more involved. But if that's something you're interested in, we can certainly teach you that. If you've got no experience with electron microscopy and you have a short project, then Shizé can assist with the data acquisition and, and oversee and supervise a student or a postdoc that's doing the, the, the data processing. And then if you have a longer, larger uh, project that needs much more extensive work, then you might want to consider collaborations with Shizé, myself, David Smith, Peter Redrick, Carpenter, you know, the core of electron microscopists at ASU.
And so we are now open for questions, if anyone has any questions. So if you have more questions, please send an email to me and we can follow up to discuss more details uh, on your specific projects. Uh, so thanks for attending. Uh, have a nice weekend.